series that we designed to help master gardeners, master naturalists, better answer questions from the public. Uh, today is our first session, Tree Pests of Concern. Our presenter is Kelly Alsop, horticulture educator, uh, serving Livingston, McLean, and Woodford counties in central Illinois, the Bloomington Normal area, Pontiac area, and Eureka area. For those of you not real familiar with the counties and where they are. Today's our first session. We have upcoming May 21st, tree identification with Travis Cleveland, and uh, June 11th, weed identification with Michelle uh, Weisbrook. Uh, both of those sessions are just about full. Actually, looking at them now, they're both full. So uh, hope you guys got registered for those and we'll see you at those as well. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Kelly in just one moment here. If you guys have questions during the presentation, feel free to go ahead and put them in the chat bar on the side. Um, we are, we have a couple of co-hosts here, myself, Reed Young, who you guys have been getting your emails from. We also have Liz Replinger and Brittany Haig, who will be helping me manage questions and make sure that uh, things run smoothly. Everyone, uh, we are planning on sticking, the, getting this to 30 minutes. We want to make it as quick and engaging as possible. Um, and then Kelly will be sticking around to answer questions at the end of the 30 minutes. All right, Kelly, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, good afternoon. Um, thank you for attending the Tree Pass Concern webinar. My specialty within the team is integrated pest management. So today I wanted to share my knowledge and resources about some tree pest of concern that um, may come into your help desk, client services, whatever you guys call it. Hey, get your nose off the table. So answering questions, um, backed by researched information is one of the primary services offered to the communities by the master gardeners and master naturalist. And so Candace, the state master gardener specialist reported to me that master gardeners answered 28,510 questions last year. That's a lot. You may have contributed to this number by helping homeowners with their tree issues. Here in McLean County, problems with trees are the bulk of our inquiries. Most of them really can be attributed to stress of living in an urban environment. And we know that stressed trees are more susceptible to insects and diseases. However, diagnosing diseases can be a bit more challenging than diagnosing tree pests. If you have a good image, a good description, and knowledge of what to look for, this can be a fairly easy task while interacting with the community. Today, I will be talking about major tree pests of concern. I am not going to cover the top three, as there are many extension resources covering them. Japanese beetle, gypsy moth, and emerald ash borer, although not covering them, they are definitely tree pests of concern. Instead, I am going to focus on seven other tree pests that are common in the Illinois landscape. So the first one is bagworm. Lots of bagworms were reported last year, but usually when they're reported to us as master gardeners, extension horticulturists, and master naturalists, it's too late to use a pesticide in order to control them. However, heavy infestations can cause defoliation and can kill branches and entire plants. When you think about defoliation, a defoliation of an evergreen is much more devastating than defoliation of a deciduous tree. Usually when deciduous trees are defoliated, 
they can recover. However, not evergreens. Bagworms have a wide host range. Um, many of you probably have seen bagworms on barberry or other, even other deciduous trees where they're creating their little uh, bags out of the foliage from their host plants. So this is a, um, this is a little bit of the life cycle. The adult females in the middle picture are wingless, legless, eyeless, and without functioning mouth parts. She remains in the bag that she built as a larva. The adult male pictured on the left actually emerges as a moth. He does not feed, but then goes to find the female within the bag, mates, and dies. Then the female lays 500 to 1,000 eggs, and those overwinter inside her dead body. Wonderful, huh? The bag is made of silk, and the plant foliage, which is why the bags can come in varied colors and um, textures. The larvae actually come out of the bag to eat the foliage around the bag. So in spring, when the larvae hatch from the eggs that were within its mother's body, the tiny caterpillars come out. They climb to the tops of trees and release a strand of silk known as ballooning. That strand of silk carries them to a new host plant. If they happen to fall on a plant that is not one of their hosts, they'll just start over, climb to the top of the tree and balloon again. This is why the damage usually starts at the top of the tree. They feed throughout the summer, and as the larvae grow, so does the bag. One of the methods of getting rid of bagworms is to remove and destroy all the bags. However, this picture on the right, that seems like a pretty daunting task, especially if they're up really high. So, if you know you have a bagworm infestation, how you're gonna know is what happened last year. You're going to want to pay attention to Japanese tree lilacs. These are known for their white puffy blooms in June. And once this Japanese tree lilac blooms, it's an indicator that these bagworm larvae are susceptible to pesticides. So there are many options of pesticides. We have BTK, which is primarily to kill um, caterpillars. We have spinosad, which is uh, a, a, an, an organic pesticide that will not kill other beneficial insects. And then pyrethroids can be um, affected too. However, it is best to control with a follow-up spray, a second spray in July. So if you're gonna go ahead and control them, you're gonna spray when you see the Japanese tree lilacs blooming, and you're gonna follow it up in July. Okay, we're going to fall webworm. So fall webworm is mostly an aesthetic problem. Like I said, it will defoliate the tree late in the season, like Japanese beetles do, but usually the tree can recover. The only problem is if that tree were to um, break buds and use up its energy, 
again before winter came would probably stress out the tree. They construct these silken webs on the tips of the branches. And, you know, they are, you know, a primary concern with um, maybe some fruit trees or pecan trees. Here in Illinois, we have two types of fall webworm. We have a northern fall webworm that's mostly white when it's an adult and the larva has black heads. We have a southern fall webworm that is a white moth with brown speckling and the larva have red, red heads. You may be at a point in the state where you experience both types. But the reason you want to know both types is if you are in the southern portion of the state and you have this southern type, you are going to have two generations per year. That first generation may be a cause of concern because the defoliation is enough to stress that plant out and make it susceptible to other insects and diseases. As the, as the uh, caterpillars eat those leaves inside the web, the web expands. They are protected from rain and predators and the gathering of them actually regulates their temperature. When they're disturbed, they actually kind of jerk their heads. The population of fall webworm peaks every eight to 16 years, and they are very sensitive to drought. So like I said, only the first generation of fall webworm really warrants sprays. The second generation appears when you see goldenrod blooming on the sides of the roads in your prairies. At this time, you can either trim out the tips, trim out those webs, or you can do what I do is just open up the webs and allow predators like birds to come and eat them. I also love opening up the webs so that I can allow in um, Parasitic flies and wasps. These are flies and wasps actually lay their egg in the body of the caterpillar. And there are 50 species that are willing to eat fall webworm. So just opening up that web can be enough for you to get them under control. Eastern tent caterpillar. The eastern tent caterpillar is a primary a concern on cherry, plum, crab apples, apples, service berries. Um, the larvae hatch when those trees break their bud. They form these communal tents in the crotch angle of the tree. They're not automatically in the crotch angle of the tree. They gradually migrate there as the population grows larger. They leave this communal tent during the day to feed and return at night and on cloudy days. The larvae then get off the tree and crawl to protected locations to pupate. This usually is a cause of concern for people if you see caterpillars crossing a sidewalk, crossing a street, this is what they are doing. So after the larva pupates, um, adults emerge. The females lay a reddish brown cluster of eggs wrapped around the stem like you see in, picture, in the left picture. These eggs will hatch the following spring. In this little cluster of egg cases, there are about 150 to 400 eggs. On the right, you see the adult. 
to control, you can remove the webs at night and on cloudy days because they too have parasitic wasps and predators that when the web is removed, they will become susceptible. You can inspect a tree for egg masses and prune them out, especially if you know you had Eastern tent caterpillar last year. And then you can apply pesticides as the saucer magnolia blooms, because at this point they haven't built the web of protection and are more susceptible to these chemical pesticides. Like with the fall webworm, the populations flux from year to year. It may be a great year for them or a bad year for them where you don't have them come into your help desk at all. Or you may be bombarded with questions about Easter tech caterpillar. Horned oak gall. If you live in Northern Illinois, you probably haven't seen this, but if you live or have been traveled to the Southern part of the state, um, horned oak gall has become a major issue, especially on pin oaks, because what happens is this gall, this woody mass, sort of two inches woody mass with horns, is on the tree and everything past that gall to the tips of the branches will actually die. So these are tiny little wasps. They emerge from those twig galls through the um, horns, usually when the oaks are breaking their buds. They lay eggs, on an oak leaf in a blister on the back of the leaves, like you see on the right. And then it, they emerge in early summer as adults. After mating, again, they lay their eggs on twigs. Now these twigs are what form these, uh, these eggs laid on these twigs are what form these oak galls. And sometimes the oak, these oak galls take two years to mature. There's really not much you can do to control a heavy population like this. You can prune out the galls, but if you're in a large area where there's many oaks, this will make no difference in the long run. I have personally seen um, oak galls at um, Lakeland College um, campus, and I saw one really infected tree, and then I walked around looking for other oaks and found that those were also infected. So I knew that, um, pretty much those oaks, those pen oaks particularly, are going to have problems in the future because this will stress out the plant. If you have them and you can prune them out, do it and think about improving the health of the tree. Don't let it go through drought um, and uh, that will help you um, save the tree. Oyster shell scale is the next one. Um, what happens is um, eggs, they overwinter under the bodies of dead females. They hatch in late spring. It's really important to catch them when they're hatching because at this time they're crawling around to feed, but then they gradually settle and attached to the plant. They lose their legs, lose their eyes, and lose their antenna. They cover themselves with nymphal skin and wax, making them almost impenetrable to chemical control. They can be a heavy infestation, can kill the plant. It can also kill off branches. 
it is important to spray during that um, crawler stage. They're small, they're red. And at this time, you're going to control those crawlers are going to be on your plant when you see the Spirea van Hoodia in bloom. Now, scale is one of those insects that can have some predators, especially in this crawler stage, that are going to, you know, eat them like you, like with aphids in your landscape. So, um, Although I don't know, think that predators only are going to control a heavy infestation like this, but it is um, important to look and see if there are other um, predator insects eating that scale, which could handle some of the problem for you. Pine needle scale. This could be a pretty serious pest on mugo pine or scots pine. Um, from far away, you, it, you can see the white on the foliage. Um, they are the, like the scale, they are um, uh, sucking the phloem from the plant. Um, it is an armored scale, so it does not um, it does not uh, produce honeydew, but um, they also, like the oyster shell scale, overwinter as eggs underneath the dead female, and the red crawlers soon emerge. Just like, um, just like with the um, oyster shell, they're going to become sessile. And they are going to use that white waxy substance to protect them from drying out, protect them from predators, and unfortunately for you, protect them from pesticides. Once they become sessile, they too lose their legs, eyes, antenna. They no longer need it anymore. The males do emerge as a tiny insect to mate with that sessile female and he is unable to eat, so he uh, dies soon after. Here you see the crawler stage on the left. This is the perfect time to spray. Once they've had those white substance, white waxy substance on the right, they are protected and very hard to control. Your pine needle scale, um, you're going to improve um, your host. You know, with all of these insects, you're always going to think about the health of the plant. Because when it comes to um, insects, tree insects, tree diseases, um, most of the time, a healthy plant is able to fend off some of these problems. This one actually has this has two generations per year. So they hatch when the Spirea van Hoodii is in bloom, and then they hatch again when Queen Anne's lace is in bloom. So, like I said, severely attacked plants can die, and you have to control these crawlers to. Uh, prevent a heavy infestation and potential death from pine needle scale. Spruce spider mite. Oh, don't we love spider mites? Unlike the two spotted spider mite that I've spent most of my time trying to kill, the spruce spider mite likes the cool weather. Two spotted spider mites tend to be, uh, tend to thrive in the warm, dry weather. Um, they um, attack needled evergreens. Again, like I said, they become active in the cool of spring. What they do is they insert their mouth parts and they suck out the cell contents, mostly the chlorophyll. And that's what leaves behind the white 
dots known as stippling. They spend their summer as eggs and then they hatch again in the cool weather of fall. Spruce spider mites, um, these are a, a good indication of when to go and scout for spruce spider mites is when your saucer magnolia is in bloom. One of the things that you can do, and there's many YouTube videos out there showing you, is you can take a white piece of paper, take that branch, shake it over that white piece of paper, and you'll see lots of little mites and you smush them. And if uh, the smushed mite leaves behind a green smear, it's probably eating your plant. If the smushed mite leaves behind a yellowish or orange smear, it's probably eating your spruce spider mites. So there are a lot of predator mites out in nature that are going to take care of this for you. However, when it comes to beneficial insects, it is hard for them to control very large populations. So if you do see beneficial insects, you could, um, you know, instead of spraying and killing them, you're still spraying them off the foliage. You could use a hard water spray to spray them off the foliage. Um, and then you can also do an insecticidal soap. Just so you know, insecticidal soap cannot be sprayed on uh, monocots. That's something that I learned a very hard lesson while working in the greenhouse, spraying uh, insecticidal soap on corn. So be careful with your insecticidal soap, even though it is, you know, organic and safer, it still can be um, something that damages plants. So I did use other people's pictures and I have references here. If you don't have the, some of these references in your help desk or through your master gardener, um, program coordinator. These are really, really good references. Um, you know, uh, the Coincide book, um, that's Don Orton. It's a really good book. What it does is it tells you exactly what you should be scouting for at, at times when things are flowering. Like I said, with the magnolia, once the magnolia blooms, you're Spur, you're scouting for spruce spider mite. The insects that feed on trees and shrubs, I have not found an insect that has come into the help desk yet that I did not find that information in there. And although not all of you, you know, uh, are close to Morton Arboretum and the more northern counties would be, have some more benefit to this newsletter, it has actually been very helpful to me in the answering help desk questions um, because I may have something come in and I don't have a clue of what it is. And when I do that, I usually start with the host and start investigating what insects attack that host. But sometimes I can go to the Morton Arboretum plant health care reports and the home yard and garden pest newsletter and find my answer because what they're doing is they're posting things in real time stuff that they have scouted and with that i can't believe i got that done in 30 minutes I ha can t somebody tell me what time i did I'm proud of you, Kelly. You're, you came in at like 29 minutes. That was perfect. Oh my gosh. I'm so, oh, <laughs> that, that I should get a reward for that. Well, uh, we'll, we'll contact the, the Nobel Prize okay. committee on your behalf. Um, we did have a handful of questions we want to uh, get to. Um, first of all, the, one of the first questions was in regard to the bagworm. 
Um, about how big are the uh, egg sacs of the bagworm? Well, they fill the body of the female bagworm. So there's not an egg sac. Her body is the egg sac. So, you know, she's probably, you know, um, you know, as big as the bag is. All right. So very morbid. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess the, I think the question was more about, you know, what, what size is the, the thing they're going to see hanging on their tree. Well, like I said, you're not going to see an egg mass. You're going to see the old bagworm, the, the old bagworm case, and inside of it is going to be the dead female, and inside of her are those many hundreds of eggs. Right, but the, the actual thing hanging on the tree, about what size is that? The bag? Yes. Um, you know, they can be fairly big. I would say average would be two inches. All right. Um, got a question about timing for the first generation of fall webworm. Yep. So that is in June. In June. Okay. So in June, you're going to start seeing the first generation of fall webworm. Again, if you live in the northern portion of the state, you're not going to see that. It's only a concern for those that live in the southern portion of the state. Now, there, like I said, there may be an overlap for those of us in central Illinois. I do not see the southern portion here in Bloomington. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's pretty rare to, to see around here. Um, what is the best way for people who do have that fall webworm a little further south that need to, uh, to take care of it? What is the best way to open up that web and start uh, removing it? Um, you know, with your hands. I don't know, poke it. I just go <laughs> rip it open. <laughs> I don't know how to answer that question. But you're not you're not squeamish, Kelly. Other people are a little more squeamish. <laughs> it's just silk. It's not like it's you know their poop, their frass. You sure. just open up. You could use a stick. Use a stick. Pick a stick up off the ground. Open that silk up as much as you can, and you'll actually be feeding your birds. Oh little double bonus. Um, so in areas without, um, I, I, I'm not sure which pest you referred to about this, but I've got the question, um, in an area without Solidago, Spirea, or Saucer Magnolia, how would you know when to control if you don't have those uh, coincides? Well, there is, um, I use those because they're very common, um, but in the coincide manual, there are other indicator species. So if you were to get that manual and you did want spruce spider mite, wanted to know when the indicator species of spruce spider mite, he, do, he does have other options. I just don't know them offhand. All right. Um, is there a, an overall pesticide that is safe for native bees, but effective for controlling pests? Well, I know if you spray BTK, you're not going to hurt bees because you're, it's a particularly for caterpillars. Usually my thing is the more selective the pesticide is, the less likely it is going to be to um, hurt beneficial insects. And, you know, stuff like the neem oil and the insecticidal soap and the spinosad, they may hurt beneficial insects if they actually come in contact with them, but they're not long lasting the way some of our other pesticides are. For instance, if you were to use a systemic imidacloprid to prevent Japanese beetles um, from feeding on your hibiscus, 
that um, is a systemic, so it goes into the plant and that will have a long effect on hurting bees. So organic pesticides still can hurt those beneficials, but they just have a shorter residual time. Now, when you compare organic pesticide effectiveness to some of the other pesticides that most of us have used in the past, they're not as effective as killing the insect. If I use an organic pesticide, I may get 50% of the population versus 90%. But that's why um, a follow-up spray is always good. Um, read the labels. Many of those sprays are gonna tell you to follow up within seven to 10 days. So I hope I answered the question. I think so. I think so. And uh, I, I, yeah, I couldn't underscore enough. Yeah, look, for, read those labels, follow those directions. Um, let's see here. I think that was about it. Someone else asked a question that was later answered in another question you were answering. Oh, does uh, uh, someone mention that they've seen people cut off the fall webworm sack and burn it? Know anything about that treatment strategy? Yeah, in my research, I read some articles about people burning it. Um, yeah, I would definitely cut it from the plant. Um, I wouldn't burn the fall webworm while still attached to the tree because trees can be very susceptible <laughs> to fire. I guess I don't, I guess I have to say that. Um, you know, I, I think burning it would be just fine, getting it away from the plant, not putting it in a compost bin. Sometimes I tell people, especially with the bagworms, to put them in a plastic bag, because if you were to you know, dump all those old bagworms somewhere else on your property, they would just crawl out and look for a host plant. So right. it would be fine if you're allowed to do that. I think we got one final question here. Someone was asking, when you talk about um, treatment helping improve a plant's overall health, can you be a bit more specific about what you mean when you say overall health? Yeah, um, what we're finding is, um, you know, I've been really um, thinking about urban trees lately and how they're really not faring very well because there's many issues with the urban environment. You know, they have to deal with the wind loads. Um, another thing is improper planting. People are not properly monitoring them. So what would I say is good care for a tree? I would say water it in times of drought I would say do a mulch ring to help conserve that moisture. I would, I would not fertilize unless you actually see um, um, nutrient deficiencies. And then I would properly prune a tree. Now I say that, but, but it, it seems from driving around in Bloomington, people try to go out there and prune their tree. They just don't properly prune it. So I'd rather you not prune it at all than, than um, prune it incorrectly. But, you know, getting rid of some of these shorter branch angles, you know, um, improving the structure just helps the tree overall. So basically water during drought and plant the tree correctly. I think that is a big issue. And when you take master gardener or master naturalist training and you learn about trees and we learn that they're supposed to have a flare and they're not supposed to be a telephone pole into the ground, that tree is going to be the first tree to have problems. So you may not be able to control that. That tree may have been there for 40 years before you bought the house, but um, good mulching, uh, watering during drought, watering especially when we have drought in combination with high temperatures will prevent tree stress. 
Uh, we did have a question. Uh, someone asked, can we get the slides? The slides were attached to the email that include the link to uh, log on today. So refer back to that email. Um, I guess if you can't find that, you could email Kelly or myself. Um, last question. Oh, go ahead, Kelly. No, and Reed and I put together that resource sheet for you. So if you have you know, uh, one of these insects come into your help desk or your, or your plant clinic or whatever. I know we all call it something different throughout the state. You can go to those resources and share those resources with your clients. And those are, most of them are University of Illinois resources. And I would say that's a document you, uh, not going to be very helpful to print out. Save that one on your uh, help desk uh, desktop if you have that. It's uh, got lots of really great links in there. Um, what are some natural predators to web webworm, Kelly? You mentioned birds. Well, definitely birds. I'm thinking, you know, uh, I, not thinking. I know that there's parasitic wasps, parasitic um, flies that lay their eggs in the body. Um, I... Uh, Stuff like um, soldier bugs, something that eats something a little bit larger. Um, you know, like the, another one is a caterpillar killer, that gr very large green bug that kills gypsy moths. So if it's a rather large, you know, good bug in the garden, it's probably going to kill those caterpillars. Uh, how would we uh, encourage those... Uh those good guys in the garden? Um, you're going to hate me when I say this. Um, stop spraying pesticides. Um, sometimes stop spraying pesticides is the answer. Uh, I know we had an apple grower that was having some serious issues with scale. And they were spraying this and giving recommendations to spray this and giving recommendations to spray this. And then finally it was said that, why don't you just stop spraying and see what naturally comes in and takes care of the pest. So even though I'm giving you pesticide recommendations, I feel like those are your last ditch effort. Like I said, Beneficial insects are not going to control high populations. You'll lose the plant if you don't do something. That's why I'd rather use, you use these pesticides at the appropriate time and use some of the, um, you know, I didn't put the harsher pesticides in the, in the PowerPoint. And if you re reference your home garden pest newsletter, you'll see that I didn't put the harsher ones in there. I put the, um, the ones that are more friendly with beneficial insects and pollinators. Um, another thing is you have to plant flowers. Pollinators will not come to your garden if they're not flowers. Um, the, the parasitic wasps and the parasitic flies I talk about, they're looking for the caterpillars to lay their eggs, but what do you think the adults eat? The adults eat pollen and nectar from flowers. So, um, have as many as much diversity in flowers as you possibly can. Um, they love the little uh, any herbs that flower. They love that. Um, they like those little small flowers, like sweet alyssum. Kelly, I have to correct a question that I asked earlier. I misread it. They were asking if there's any natural predators to bagworm, not webworm. Do you know, I, I don't think so. I mean, I'm sure there are. I mean, I'm sure I just have not seen the research. But I think that it would be hard for a predator to get to a bagworm. Um, that's my best guess. I, I, I can't come up with a better answer right now. All right. Well, thank you, Kelly. And thank you for our 130 folks who are still on here. Thanks for coming by today. We will be back with the next session on Tree ID on May 11th. That workshop is full. Um, if you email me, 
I can probably get you the link still, um, as we, we usually don't get the full 300 people showing up. Um, but uh, thanks for coming by today, and we will see you next time. Thank you, Reed. <laughs>